I love the phrase in that song, who was and is and is to come. That's the God that we serve. The God that was, the God that is today, and the, uh, the God that will return someday for us. And that's why we get to gather, we get to celebrate and worship and learn, uh, because God is still on the throne. He's still King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. I am so glad that you guys are here today. Uh, over the summer, we've been going through a, a series on Proverbs, looking at words of wisdom. And we've been learning how, as King Solomon writes to his son, he's giving him advice and direction on how to live, and he basically says there's two ways to live. There's either the way of, of God, which is surrendering to God and seeking God's way, and he says that is what? Wisdom. That's wise. That's the way to do it. Or we can live the way of the world. We can live chasing after what the world says is acceptable, and, but King Solomon says that's foolish. Right? And so we have, this, we have this two ways to look at life, and we have the choice to make in a lot of different areas. Last week, we touched on the topic of marriage and uh, just barely scratched the surface, but talk, talked about what does it look like to have a godly wife, a godly husband, a wise marriage, you know, and how can we be faithful and following after who God wants us to be? And sadly, there's also foolish examples. And so we looked at marriage. Today we're going on and we're looking at another relational element in the sense of parenting. How do we be godly parents. How do we choose wisely to be a parent to our kids? Now, this topic covers all of us. Whether you are grandparents, whether you are aunts and uncles, whether you have kids of your own, whether you, kids aren't even on the horizon yet, all right, this still covers, and there's still truth that can be learned here. Okay, so don't check out. Stay in tune, okay? Uh, what we're going to look at. Let's, uh, let's begin our service or the message with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your spirit being here already. We thank you, Lord, for the time of worship and just meeting with you. Help us, Lord, to turn our eyes to who you are and who you want us to be. I pray, Lord, that you will hide me behind the cross as I share this morning. Let the words be your words of truth. Help each one of us to open our hearts and our ears and our souls to be receptive to your message. In your name, amen. Children are a, uh, a blessing, aren't they? Children are a blessing from God. I, I, hope you, I hope you agree with that. I hope that the, that's the statement. Now, sir, sure, sometimes we want to strangle our kids, but, uh, but children are a blessing from God. The psalmist says in Psalm 127, he says, Children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a heritage from the Lord, an offspring, a reward from Him. That's, that's what the psalmist paints this picture, that our kids are blessings from God. I love how the message version, the message version of Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, it says, don't you see that children are God's best gift? Don't you see it? Don't you know it? That children are God's best gift? And he, he talks there in verse 4 about how blessed you are as parents to have children. Now, I know that there's, there's a variety of different uh, uh, you know, places in life that we are, and, and this idea of children, it, it can, you know, maybe we have kids, and you know, they're grown and gone. Maybe we never could have kids. Maybe we wish we had kids. Maybe we wish we didn't have No, I hope you don't say that. Because, blessed, they are a blessing from God. Right? They are a blessing from God. The world says that children basically are a byproduct of a sexual encounter between a man and a woman. The Bible says, God says, children are so much more. Children are a blessing. They're a precious gift. There's something to be valued. It doesn't matter how they came to be, but they are valued. And they are precious. We look in Job Job chapter 33, verse 4, he says, The Spirit of God is the one that made me. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gave me life. You see, we, we also see in Psalms uh, 139, verse 13 and 14, it says, the psalmist says, he's, he's crying out to God, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
every child that, that is born, regardless of how they came about, every child that is born is a blessing. They are, they are created by God. God has a plan and a purpose for them. God loves them, and so do we. Right? I hope so. I hope so. I hope you, I hope you, you have that same mindset about kids. But, it, you know, we, we can acknowledge that kids are a blessing from God, but how many of you are like me that wish the kids came with their owner's manual? Anybody? I remember when uh, my wife and I brought Bryce, our, our son, home, our first child. We brought him home, and, and I remember standing in our living room one day, and he's in his car seat, and I'm just looking at him. I'm like, now what? I, I don't know what to do. Right? Anybody else like that? It's like, I wish they came with an owner's manual. Uh, you know, okay, they're crying. How do you stop that, you know? Well, well, there is an owner's manual that comes with our children, and it's this book right here, the Bible, God's Word. In this book, there are answers to almost everything in life, minus is the Loch Ness Monster real and why are mosquitoes existing, you know? I, don't, I haven't found those yet in Scripture, but almost anything else you want to know, you could probably go to God's Word and find truth. And there's a lot in Scripture that talks to us about how to be godly parents, how to be godly grandparents, how to be godly aunt and uncle, how to be a godly coach, how to be a godly teacher, how to be a godly person that pours into the life of these blessings called children. And so today, we're going to look at one passage in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26, or 22, verse 6. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Proverbs 22, verse 6. This is probably one of the most well-known passages in Proverbs, but also probably one of the most misinterpreted or misunderstood passages of Proverbs. Okay, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. You know, if, you, if you have a daughter, you can insert her or she, right? Okay, Both ways. But train a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I want you to know that this is not a promise, but rather a probability. And let me explain that. We live in a world, we live in a society where we like facts. We like things to add up and make sense. So we kind of have this mindset that A plus B equals C, right? Or 1 plus 2 equals 3, right? Make sure you're ready, okay? We have, this, we have this idea that everything has to line up. If I do this and do this, then I get this result. And this is where we misinterpret this passage, because sometimes, especially those of us in the church, those of us that are Christ followers, we look at this passage with kind of hope-filled eyes, and we say, if I train up my child when they're little, if I teach them about God, if I teach them about the Bible stories, if I take them to church, if I do all those things, then when he is old, he'll continue to follow it. And we wish that was the case. We wish that that could be a promise to us, but it's not. Rather, King Solomon, as he's writing to his son and he's writing to us, and he's saying, when you train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he won't depart from it, he's basically saying, when you teach them about God and you give them every opportunity to know who God is and to follow him, then the probability is very likely that when they get old, they will remember it. The possibility is strong, but there's no guarantee. And that's where some of us struggle. Well, I want the guarantee. I want to know how come. I mean, I did everything I could. I poured into my kids, and I taught them. We did devotions, and we prayed, and I took them to church. But now look at them. They've walked away from the Lord. I want the guarantee. There is no guarantee. Following after Christ is a personal decision that each and every one of us have to make. Every one of our kids, we can teach them and we can help them and we can, we can guide them and we can give them every opportunity. But ultimately, they're the ones that have to make the personal choice. 
This passage is not a promise, it's a probability. All right? And we need to understand that as we're, as we're looking at, at life. We need, you know, we, need to, we need to teach our kids, but it's challenging. Life gets in the way sometimes. I mean, we look at life and we say, hey, I want my kids to grow up and know who Christ is, and I want them in the church, and I want them following God. But look at life. Look at my work schedule. I'm working 60, 70 hours a week. I can't do it. Ah, look, you know, look, at, look at the environment that I live in. It's just not compatible. Maybe for some of you, you're like, you have that desire, you want them to know Christ, but you yourself don't have that biblical truth. You don't have the knowledge base. You don't have that assurance of who Jesus is in your own life. And how am I supposed to teach my kids? And so what we do in society is we say, I love the Lord, or I want my kids to love the Lord. And so we, we bring them to the church, and we say, church, you fix them. I, I, years ago when I was a youth pastor, I was sitting in my office, and I had a father and a son come in. He was in junior high. I'd never met these guys. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know their names. They came in. They said, you're the youth pastor. I said, yeah, how can I help you? And they sit down in my office, and the father says, my son's got issues. I want you to fix him. I can't do that. I can, I can come along and help, and I can talk and counsel, and I can try to pour in, but I can't fix him. But we have this idea that the church's job is to fix our kids. I mean, I'm going to bring my kids, and I'm going to bring them to Sunday school, and I'm going to bring them to junior church, and I'm going to bring them to Awana, and I'm going to, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to bring them to all your stuff. You fix them. I read a study this week that talked about the time our kids spend uh, doing stuff. <laughs> Roughly, our children spend about 40 hours a week in school. They spend about 30 hours a week watching TV or on the internet. They spend another 30 hours a week with their friends, most of whom probably aren't Christian. That's 150 hours a week when the world gets to pour into their kids. I did the numbers. I'm like, okay, what if, what if our faithful families, you know, how much time do we as a church get to pour into those kids? If you bring your kids to junior church and to, to uh, Sunday school and to Awana, Every week, while it's offered, we get to influence your kids about 150 hours a year. 100 hours a week, the world gets to spend with your kids, and we as a church get to spend about 150 hours a year. It's not possible. That's why King Solomon says it's your job as parents to teach your kids. It's your responsibility. It's not our responsibility. The church, it is not our job to teach and train your kids to follow after God. Our job, listen closely, our job is to come alongside you and encourage you as the parents and resource you as the parents and, and challenge you as the parents and, and come alongside and kind of supplement what you're, do, what you're talking about at home and helping make that truth. We can't do it as the church. It has to happen in the home. Okay? So whether you're a grandparent, whether you're aunt and uncle, whether you're the parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're, you know, the, the babysitter, wherever you are, you, your job, your responsibility, if you want them to know who Jesus is and, and live a godly life, your job is to teach them and train them of, of who Jesus is. So let's look at this passage. Let's look at this passage and, and, and break it down a little bit. The, the first word there is train. Right? And, and so what does that mean, to train a child, to, to, to train somebody? The word that's used here is basically this idea of making it narrow, of focusing in on something, of making it a priority. So as parents, when you are supposed to train your children, you are focusing their attention, you are focusing the conversations, you are focusing uh, in on making it narrow into something that, that they need to know. Okay? It, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. At least in our household, if, if I tell my kids to go, you know, go pick up their stuff in their room, to me that means clean your room. 
To them, that means pick up the stuff that's on the floor. You know? uh, and, and so, you know, sometimes, sometimes we have to be pretty, pretty uh, pointed, make it pretty clear of what we want them to do. And so when, when Solomon's writing, teach your children or train your children, this is what he's doing. He's saying, make it, make it a focus. That Hebrew word that is used there for train is also a word that's used for the word palate. You know, your mouth, your palate. In, in biblical understanding is, is that in biblical times, the nursemaid, if the child wasn't eating or the child wasn't uh, getting enough food, a nursemaid would take crushed dates and put them in the, the child's mouth. And that would create an appetite. It would create a desire for that child to want to eat more. And so that's the concept that we've got to have here. The word is training. It's, it's creating a palate. It's making it something that they want. It has, to be, it has to be enjoyable for them, a desire. We can't, unfortunately, we can't cram Jesus down our kid's throat. We can't. It's not going to work, because each, each person has to choose for themselves who Jesus is. But here's what we can do. As grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles and family friends and everybody else, coaches and teachers, and every, what we can do is, one, we need to live it out. We need to live out our faith and make sure that we're living it and teaching it and, and setting the example. But secondly, we need to present it in such a way that it is, it is appealing and appetizing to our children. That they want it. The way you're teaching them, the way you're living your faith is going to reflect on whether or not your kids want to have anything to do with it. If you badmouth the church, if you badmouth Christians, if you badmouth the Bible, then what are your kids going to hear? The same exact thing. Yet if your kids see you hungry for God's word, dedicated to church, dedicated to God's people, then what are your kids going to learn? The same truth. This is why. Church, this is why it's important that you are in church, that you are plugged in and involved. This is why it's important to go to classes where you can learn biblical truth and you can grow in your own faith. This is why it's important to be in a small group where you can have relationships with others and you can have that accountability. Because the responsibility for our kids to know who Jesus is is ours, not the church's. All right? We need to train our kids. Secondly, well, let me, before I get there, when we're talking about training, let me go to this, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. We need to live out that faith. It needs to be a real faith. And we need to be looking for every opportunity we can to teach our children who Jesus is, to helping them focus in on that message of Christ. I found a quote that talks about this very thing. It says, I can't guarantee that if you if you live out God's word before your children that they won't always, let me start over. I can't guarantee that if you live out God's word before your children that they will always buy into it and follow it. But I can about guarantee you that if you don't, they won't. There is no guarantee that our kids are going to follow after Christ. But if we're not setting an example for them at all, the chances go way down that they're ever going to know who Jesus is. And that's a hard one for us. Because yeah, I know some of you are like, hey, I've been try I tried to raise my kids, and I tried to pour into them, and I tried to give them all those opportunities, but, but look, where they at? I can almost guarantee you, because of God's word right here, I can almost guarantee you that God's word is still true in their hearts and lives. Whether they're choosing to accept it or not is up to them. 
but it's still there and it's still affecting them. And so as parents, the, the challenge, the encouragement is don't ever stop. Be praying for your kids. Be loving on your kids. Be teaching your kids, helping them see who God's word is, what it looks like. Secondly, we have, we're, we're supposed to teach our children uh, the way. We're supposed to teach our children the way. What, what's the way? Well, we have the foolish way. We know about that. That's the world's way. Hopefully, you're not teaching your kids that way, okay? Don't, that's no-no. Don't go there. Sadly, some, people, some parents do, right? We have the, the foolish way, or we also have godly way. This is the stuff we're looking at. This is scripture. This is truth. When we're teaching our kids about God's way and God's wisdom, then we're teaching our kids morally. We're teaching our kids about finances. We're teaching our kids about how we think, about our habits, about what faith is. We're teaching our kids to, to seek after God. So we have the foolish way. We have the wise way. And let me offer you, there is a third way, and that is the way of the child. The way of the child. The best illustration of this is uh, what Chuck Sundahl says. He says, we receive our children from the hand of God, not as soft, pliable lumps of clay ready to be molded into what we think they should be. Rather, each child comes with a set of abilities, intellectual capacity, and a way of perceiving and thinking, all of which were endowed by God. We have the foolish way, we have the wise way, and we have the way of the child, which basically means that each one of us, when we were born, we were created unique. We are created different. And thankfully so, right? We have different personalities, different hobbies, different interests, different likes and, and dislikes. And all of that is because that is how God wired us. And as parents, if we want to be godly parents, then we need to figure out how do we, how do we nurture who our kids are. It's just along the way. So if you have a kid that's extremely brilliant and very intellectual, then you need to do everything you can as a parent to help model that and help that grow while pointing them to Jesus. If you have a kid that's extremely athletic, then you need to help develop that and teach them along the way, but while they're also learning about Jesus. If you have a kid that is an introvert, don't try to make them an extrovert, but rather, Teach them how God has a plan and a purpose and how God can use them just the way they are while teaching them about Jesus. There is the, the foolish way and the wise way and the way of the child, and we as parents, our responsibility is to nurture them while we're also pointing them to Jesus. Okay? And then last but not least, it says when they're old, they won't turn from it. This one gets hard. Because it's not a promise there's no guarantee but if we're honest and we look at our own selves we some of us could say wow I had quite the journey too but thankfully something happened in my life where I came back to the Lord it's a personal responsibility for each one of those kids for each child that we have, it's their responsibility whether or not they're going to accept and believe and follow what we teach them and train them. But just like that quote said, if we don't even start, the probability goes way down that they'll ever know Jesus. But if we are speaking truth, if we are teaching them and training them and impressing upon them through life and journeying with them in life, then, then there is a chance that they're going to come back to know who Christ is. And so if you have children that have gone wayward, don't stop praying. Yeah, you can't ground them anymore, but you can pray for them. Pray for them. Continue to teach them, continue to love them, continue to walk in this life with them and model before them what it looks like to, to love Jesus and, and, and to crave Jesus so that they find it appealing.